Hey everybody, welcome to Wednesday night. It's so good that you've tuned in and you've joined us, uh, whether you're on Facebook with our premiere or you're on YouTube with our premiere. It's so good to have you uh, tonight. Why don't we pray and I wanna get started. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us and your goodness. God, you are continually faithful. I pray for each and every person that is, that's listening, watching us tonight, that God, you would just encourage them, strengthen them for the rest of the week that they are facing. Father, it's an exciting week this week. Uh, we've got Good Friday and we've got Easter. Lord, we're still living in the excitement as a church of remembering that Jesus came and he died and he rose again. And this is why we're here. This is why we exist. We are so thankful for what you've done for us. We're excited to be your people. And all this we pray in your name. Amen. Why don't you uh, grab a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 8. We're going to just read verse 1. And I just want to pull a, a concept out of this passage tonight, just speak into your life and give you something to chew on for the rest of the week. It says this in chapter 8, a uh, book of Acts, verse 1. It says, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. I don't know how familiar you are with Jesus' command uh, to the disciples. He had given them a command uh, way prior to this. Uh, most of us should know back in, in Matthew, the end of Matthew, we, we, we read it a lot. It's called the Great Commission. And he told them, go and make disciples of all nations, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he told them, teach people to obey everything that I have commanded to you. But the first seven chapters of Acts, if you go back and read them a little bit later, uh, you'll see that all that's happened up until this point in chapter 8, has happened in Jerusalem. I mean, what happened to the rest of the nations? Uh, obviously, Jesus had a plan for other nations, and not just Israel, but the disciples were focused on just their nation right now. They're, they're still focused on one nation, just Israel. But it wasn't Jesus' intention for them to focus just on their nation. If you look at Jesus' ministry, much of it wasn't even in Israel. He did go to a lot of the outer lying areas that were, uh, that were predominantly Gentile and even into Samaria. So when we come to the story of our passage, uh, just before it, it is, uh, Stephen's getting arrested and they brought false testimony against him. They couldn't find anything to bring against him that was legit. Uh, his wisdom had continually confounded them. And so the, all, the best way to arrest Stephen is to lie about him. And so they lied about him. He's brought to the Sanhedrin, and he's standing before them. He begins to give them this incredible speech, I mean, an awesome record uh, of God's working within his people and, and, uh, and also up to the revealing of Christ. And, and, and when, he comes to the end, when he comes to the end, he calls them stiff-necked, and, and everything just goes down from, downhill from there. Have you, have you ever just thought you probably should have stopped a couple sentences ago instead of gone where you went? You just made the situation worse. It was kind of like that with Stephen, probably well warranted even at that because the Sanhedrin and the people had rejected Christ and there was a point to be made, but that point cost Stephen his life and he's, he's brought outside and stoned and stoning basically was put somebody in the, the center of a circle and you would throw large stones at him and, until he died. This is how Stephen uh, dies as the first martyr uh, of the church. The passage we, real, we read illustrates the shockwaves that this event sent through the early church because a, a great persecution breaks out. I, I guarantee the thinking of our, our church in all this was, you know, with things going so well, uh, why change what we're doing? Sometimes we, you know, the, the thinking of the church is this. I mean, it's going great. What we're doing is great. We're reaching Jerusalem. We're doing great things. And so since we're doing great things, why would we change anything? Every, everything that they've done up to this point ha has transpired in Jerusalem. So think of the previous chapters. And we're not going to count everything that is in there. But Peter's message in Acts 2, he, he preaches. Uh, people's hearts are stricken. They say, what should we do about this? Because they realize that they put the, the Messiah to death. They crucified Christ. He makes the point clear. And they... 3,000 people are saved, and that's just the men. I mean, they don't even uh, count the women and the children. So a minimum of 3,000 people are saved and water baptized on that day. Peter healed the cripple at the temple gate, beautiful. And where is it? That's in uh, Jerusalem. Peter and John are, 
are called before the Sanhedrin to give an account. Where is it happening? In Jerusalem. People are being healed at Solomon's colonnade up at the temple in Jerusalem. So you're getting the idea. Everything's in Jerusalem, a very centralized place. And here's one of the greatest problems, I think, in the church. We get used to what works, and we think only what works is what works, if that makes sense. All the while, that you know, times are changing. Times are changing around us. Uh, people are changing. People are different today, how they look at things, how they process things. Much, very much different than just maybe 10, 20 years ago, even maybe five years ago. The challenges that people are facing today are changing. They're, they're different types of problems and issues. I understand nothing's new under the sun, but at the same time, there's a, there's a lot of things that are just different about what people face today and how they process the things that they face. People's tastes are changing. People's taste in music, it changes. The pre pre how, how they want things presented to them are changing. How people listen, uh, when they sit to listen to somebody else speak, it, it's, it's changed how they listen. And so I, I don't mishear, mishear me in all of this. We're not changing the message of the gospel. And, and nobody's changing the message of, of the Bible and scripture. But the church, like anything else, cannot become static and think that this is how we've always done it. This is how it has always worked. And this is how it must work until Jesus comes back. We, we can't have that kind of thinking. So in, in essence, the church didn't move out of Jerusalem yet because they didn't see the need to. There just hadn't been a reason to leave Jerusalem. It's like you. You don't open up the fridge unless there's a need to, that you're hungry. You don't go to work uh, any earlier than you, you have to, you're expected to, because there's not a need to. You don't go to bed until you're tired. You, you don't do things many times unless there's a need, and, and the need pushes you to do what you're not presently doing. And Jesus is the head of the church. He told them they must wait in Jerusalem for the gift, but he also told them to move out into all the nations. You know, they got the first part well. They did the, the first part spot on, but they, they, didn't, they didn't make a move on the second. They, they didn't do anything about going yet. They had just stayed in this place. And you have to realize this was an important place to them. But God was about to make them go. That's the point. You have this great power as a parent. Uh, your kids are playing Xbox in the house, they're being too loud for you. You told them several times, quiet down, you're being way too loud. You told them that, okay, you need to go outside more. You can't just be a video game zombie. You, you need to go do something else. And you have this ability to go right over to the Xbox and, and hit the power button and shut it off in the middle of the game. No, no chances to save and all the kids are like, mom, you're, you're ruining our lives and this isn't fair and you're just like, life isn't fair, get out. You have this power as a parent to, to to move everyone out of the, the home. A, a sudden shakeup moves them out and, and they have to obey you now. And honestly, they don't even wanna be around you anyway. So it probably works out that it's just best that they, they go outside. Problem solved. I, I bet there was a lot of believers in Acts that were thinking that this is the worst thing that could happen to the church. I mean, the church at this time is, it's a very young church. And you know, when something's young, it's very fragile. They could have looked at it and said, this could ruin everything. Just as we are starting to get momentum, just as we are beginning to see people saved, just as we felt like we were getting things on track, this happens, and now what? I bet a lot of churches uh, felt that way. When we had the, the recommendation for no groups over 10, well, what are we supposed to do now? How, how are we supposed to stay connected? How, how do we have our services? How do we reach our community? How do we stay healthy? How do we keep thriving? How do we do these things? And like all of us know, we view negative situations like they're the worst thing that could possibly happen. They are uh, they're, they're, they're the obvious obstacles in life, and, and we worry about those things. Think about yourself. What, what's the worst thing that's, that's ever happened in your life? What, what's the worst day that you've ever had? The, the bottom of your life may be just dropped out, you faced something completely unsurmountable, and you were like, well, now what? What, what am I supposed to do at this point? Think of, think of a day like that. This is, 
this is what the church is facing. The church is facing an, an incredible persecution. It seems like an insurmountable event. And even that, thanks to Saul especially, because he's breathing murderous threats. He's going from house to house after this passage. He is pulling Christians from their homes. He's arresting them and persecuting them. It's a, this is a difficult, dark day for them. I, I hope all the social distancing and not meeting over meeting is over on April 30th. I, I feel just like everybody else. I, I'm looking at that target date. I'm very optimistic. I'm praying that it's done. And then when we come back and have services, we're going to have a big celebration service that we're all back together in church. And I know one person who really hopes that uh, we come back after April 30th. I know Pastor Joe is counting the days. He's literally counting the days right now until we are back into church, hopefully. And, and I think he might lose his mind over all this stay-at-home stuff because he's got a lot of pent-up energy. Uh, all this only going out if necessary stuff. Uh, he's about to lose his mind on it. And uh, we're only a couple of days in. And so you can pray for him. But I think the church is, is, we get too comfortable in our own skin. We get too comfortable in the, in the four walls. We, 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 get, we put a lot of faith into this. We put a lot of purpose into this. And so we start to think that everything that we do emanates from this, from a wall, from a building, from a place. But we have to understand that um, the church is mobile. The church is us. The church is people. We're active six other days in a week. Th this only really serves us for, for a day, this place. It's just a, a place that we come and we meet together. But we're, we're mobile. We're active. We're, we're moving a, a, about. Um, we're out in the workplace. We've got, we've got people that we're constantly interacting with. We're with our neighbors and, and we're interacting even with strangers. And so the church is more than, than the walls. It, it's us. Adversity, understand this, adversity develops adaptability. adaptability. That's what it does for us. Adversity develops adaptability. It, it causes you to look at what you're, what you're doing from a, a different angle. Uh, until, there, until this point, there was, there was no persecution of this sort in Acts. There was some persecution, but not to this sort. Not, this was a game changer of persecution. And I guarantee the church was thinking at this time, with things going so well, why change what, what we're doing? Uh, until now, one great moment after another was happening in Jerusalem. People are being saved. People are being healed. People are being changed. People are being freed. I mean, one thing after another is happening incredibly in Jerusalem. And everything they've done up to this point, again, was in Jerusalem. But now things have changed. The church has immediately had to adapt. If the door has closed in Jerusalem, now what? I mean, do we just, do we just quit? Do we just shutter the doors and tell everybody, see you in a month, you know? No, they adapted. They had adapted to the situation that was given to them. They couldn't stop what they were doing because Jesus was too important. And I, I, I believe that you believe the same thing is that Jesus is too important to stop what we're supposed to be doing, even though we might not be able to, to meet in this place, in the walled place, in the building of the church, Jesus is still too important for us to just stop doing what we're doing. We still have something to do. We still have a gospel to live. We have a, a gospel still to present, a message to bring to people around us. Three verses later from our passage, Philip's in Samaria. This is what the scattering does. Watch. He's in Samaria now, not a place that any of them have gone. But Samaria is where he's found himself preaching to the crowds. He's, he's healing people. He's casting out demons. And, and they would never had experienced, the people of Samaria would have never experienced the power of God as it was expressed through the life of Philip unless the disciples and the apostles and the people in general were scattered with this mentality, we have to bring the gospel out someplace else. Simon the sorcerer in the same, the, the same story, he's He's silenced, and, and people are freed from putting their faith in an ungodly man, a, a man who really is, is demonically inspired, and now they've been freed so that they can worship God and know God and live God, live for God and, and, and understand who he is and find salvation in Christ. Philip opens up the scriptures to an Ethiopian. Ethiopian. He, he, he stops by and he begins to explain the scriptures to this Ethiopian who has 
these questions. And now he's impacting somebody who's completely from outside their region, somebody from a different country on a different continent. And he, be, he baptizes this eunuch and guarantee this eunuch who's a high official in Ethiopia is bringing now the gospel back to Ethiopia. And so now the gospel is having the ability to go like Jesus said it ought to go because it's no longer confined to a place, to a, a, a city. And we further see it's God's desire to scatter the church. It, it was very difficult for the church to be scattered, but that it came through persecution. But we read in the next chapter, we read about Saul on the road to Damascus. And Jesus comes and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, and Saul has this radical conversion. He goes from Saul to the, to the Paul, the apostle that we know. And, and, and God calls him to who? The Gentiles. God has a way of getting his message across. God has a way of getting the church and his people, although they might be very effective where they're at, he has a way of getting them out of where they've been effective so they can be effective in other places. See, if the church wouldn't follow the plan, then God had a way of forcing them in that direction to do a greater work. And I'm sure up to this point that the church just felt like, man, we're killing it in Jerusalem. We're doing incredible things in Jerusalem. They were like, we're, in, we're unstoppable. We're doing so much good, but then to some extent, they, they were stopped. And, and there's just this change in plans. If you don't understand the Jewish mind much, especially in this day and age in Acts, Jerusalem is the holy city. That's what they refer to it as. It was God's city. It was the city of David. Jews revered Jerusalem. And I can't help but think that even though the apostles who were who were devoted to Christ and had heard Christ say, bring this message, disciple people, tell them to obey all the things that I've commanded to you, not just here, but in Judea, Samaria, and areas beyond. I can't help that as men who grew up Jewish, that they still had ingrained in them that Jerusalem was important above all. And I just wonder sometimes if the things that we hold in great importance are not as important to God as we think that they are. Was Jerusalem important to God? You better believe it. He wanted people there to be saved. But Jerusalem wasn't the only city on God's list. Jerusalem wasn't the only important place. Now that Jesus had come, people, people are important. God wants humanity to come and be reconciled to him. It's not that it's changed so much from the Old Testament. God has always desired to draw people to himself. But now radically, incredibly through Christ, God wants to do that. I wonder sometimes if we struggle with the same things of thinking certain things are important and we're holding on to some sacred cows in a sense, just like the, the apostles were of trying to reach Jerusalem. Maybe they had this mentality of after we get everybody in Jerusalem saved, then we can move on to the next place. I mean, you, you guys can multitask. You don't have to just stay in Jerusalem to do that. That'll come in time, but you've got to get out and bring the gospel. I wonder, I just wonder sometimes, and maybe we can be challenging ourselves with that is, are we holding on to some sacred things that God really doesn't care about that God doesn't look at as sacred because he has a greater mission in mind. Maybe God's revealing that to us even now in the times that we're living in. See, a door now opened that they had not considered. They had not thought about that because the need had not arisen. Samaria and beyond now, the Gentiles, things were opening up for them. And because of the adversity, they had to adapt to who they approached with the gospel. You can preach the gospel the same way to the Gentiles as you did to the Jews. They, they were forced to adapt. And I want you to know today that even in our day and age, we have to, as a church, adapt to the cultures and the lives and the ethnic groups around us. People hear things differently. And the gospel means and can be approached to people in different ways and still be incredibly effective. Their perspective of who the gospel was for and the extent, extent of it was changed. Go several chapters ahead and and when the, the Jerusalem council calls Peter back after he's gone to the Gentiles' home of Cornelius, the centurion, and, and all of them have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and they call him back basically to kind of give an account because some troublemakers are, are making things out to be what they're not. You know, Peter has to come back and confess to them, you know, that it seems like God has given the gift to the Gentiles also. I mean, this is something that's never even crossed their minds. They never even considered. They never saw the need for because they were so wrapped up in what they thought was needed 
But God was pushing them out through the persecution. Was it difficult? You better believe it was difficult. It was, it was life-altering. It was life-changing. But they had to adapt to it. The adversity caused them to adapt to their new surroundings and bring the gospel maybe in new ways to new places. In the difficulty, God brought something out of the church. Maybe the church didn't even know that they had it uh, uh, within them. But he showed them that the, ch the church was made for times like this. The church was made for adversity. It, it could thrive in times of difficulty. And we see the church thriving. We, we read the subsequent chapters after this and we see the church thriving incredibly as a whole, but also they could thrive as individuals where God had planted them in the places that they lived. Maybe you found yourself restless uh, or, or resting, I should say. Maybe you found, found yourself resting on the church to fulfill the Great Commission. And that's very easy to do, that we could just expect the church uh, to do the business of bringing the gospel. It's easy to think, hey, I'm part of the church and, and people need to come here and, and they need to be with us. And when they're with us, they'll be saved. But look, in our day and age, we've got reduced contact, but you're probably seeing your neighbors more. You're probably seeing people at home more, working at home more, spending more time outdoors. I know that I am. I've been seeing a lot more of my neighbors around my house. And now is a good time maybe for you to develop a relationship with somebody who was just right next door. Rather than expecting them to, to come to your place, your, your house, your walls, Maybe it's time for us to think about how we're bringing the gospel to those around us since they can't come. I mean, we can invite them in online, but it's bigger than that. It's about creating relationships. Now's a good time to develop a relationship with a next door neighbor and, and see where God leads you to share the gospel with them or to live the gospel in front of them. Just let God lead you in the midst of all of it. This is a great time for the church to just get practical. When the Jerusalem crackdown happened, in Acts, the church didn't go into isolation. They scattered. And when they scattered, they brought the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, wherever they found themselves newly planted. So I'm going to encourage you, don't, let's not cower in fear over this. Let's be wise. We'd have to be sanitary. You know, wash your hands for, for 20 seconds like they recommend. Don't be touching your face. But, but we don't live by fear. We live according to faith. So keep looking for opportunity to share Christ. Look at you as a Christian so that people can look and say, well, that's, that's what a Christian lives like. That's, that's a real, genuine believer. And living as a Christian, maybe from a different angle. I believe God is, is just opening up new doors for us, for the church as a whole, and even for you as an individual. Doors that you might have never considered, things that you never thought were a need before now. I challenge you just to pray and seek God and say, Lord, help me to see the needs of people around me. Help me to see the needs where I can bring the gospel in places that I didn't think that I could bring it before. Or I didn't feel like I had the confidence. I didn't feel like I had the ability. But God, you're, you're opening up those doors now to me. Can you pray and believe for new opportunities that God is opening up to you? Uh, maybe a new opportunity that you hadn't taken advantage of that you're seeing and saying, I can take advantage of that. In, our present, in my present difficulty, um, I, if it didn't enter our days, I would have never seen it before. Is God opening up some areas like that for you, some opportunities? I trust that he is. Can I just pray with you really quick this morning or, and believe that God is opening up new doors for you? Father, we pray right now that you would just touch each and every one who's tuned in with us. God, help us to see the new opportunities. You've pushed us out of our comfort zone. You've pushed us out of the walls of the church. And it's a good thing. You, you pushed us out and maybe we didn't like it at first, but God, I pray right now we're settling into it. We've still got a couple of weeks of this. Lord, let us be settling into this and saying, not waiting for things to be done to go back to how we used to do them, but being challenged right now to say, God, you pushed me out of my comfort zone. You pushed me into a new arena. How do I operate here? How do I sh share the gospel here? How are you opening up new areas of ministry for our church and also for our lives as individuals? So God, right now we pray, open up our eyes 
Help us to see the need. Lord, maybe there was harvest fields around us that are ripe for harvest that we're completely missing. We just didn't see the need, but God, you knew there was a need. And right now you've pushed us out of our comfort zone and you're saying, there's the field that's ripe for, har- for, for, har- for harvest. So go and, and, and reach that need and reach those people. God, we pray it right now in your name. All as we pray, amen. I'm believing great things for the rest of your week. I'm excited about being able to celebrate Easter this Sunday, even though we're doing that online tune in. We've got some special elements for our Easter service uh, this Sunday. Don't forget also about our Easter egg drive through coming up this Saturday. If you've got kids, pile them up into your car, bring them out, and we're going to just deliver some baskets into your car. You don't even have to exit your vehicle. We'll just give you those baskets for your kids just to give them something special uh, for this season. That's from 10 to 12. While supplies last, we only have so many baskets, so make sure that you come out and tell your friends, tell your neighbors, uh, let them come out and be a part of it as well. We're praying for you. We're believing uh, that God is doing great things in your life and that you are approaching things from a new angle and being used uh, very effectively, even in this new day and age. We love you, praying for you. Have a great night.